Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video we're gonna take a trip down memory lane and I'm gonna show you the evolution of the properties feature in C-Sharp from C-Sharp 1 all the way to C-Sharp 10. I love making these types of videos because not only I get to talk about the feature, why it exists and give you all the background on the feature and how it works behind the scenes, but I also get to show you what changed from version to version and appreciate how the C-Sharp team has listened to requests and expanded the language forward. Now, I've already made a couple of videos like this one. You can check them in the channel. I'm going to leave them in the description down below. But this video is also a request by a viewer who wants to see the evolution of properties. If you want to see the evolution of a feature in C Sharp as well, leave a comment down below and I'll make that video. Without any further ado, let's go straight into the content. If you like the content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell and for more training, check out nickchapsas.com. So let's talk about the properties feature like in the first place. Why does it exist? What problem does it solve? And I'm going to go all the way back to C Sharp 1. All the projects in this repository have been updated to point to the relative version of the language. So if I try to do something that the language doesn't support, I'm going to get a compilation error. So why do properties exist, right? You have to remember that the C Sharp started at the time to compete with Java. Uh, and Java and many other object-oriented programming languages uh, have as one of their fundamental ideas the concept of encapsulation. So you might have a user and that user have a private field and that field will be, let's say, a string called first name, right? Now that field would need to be set and retrieved by external classes and you might not want to give direct access to that field because you might want to update the first name in a very specific way. For example, you might want to have some validation there or you might have some characters that you don't allow the name to have. So for many valid reasons, you might want to support encapsulation. Now the Java world, which is where I learned how to code, we used to have to do this. You'd have to make a public string called get first name. And what that method would do is it would return the, the first name. Or maybe you wouldn't have the getter because you wanted this property to not be exposed outside. But if you wanted to expose it outside of this class, you'd have a getter. Uh, and if you wanted to allow uh, someone to set that value outside of that class, you have a public void called set first name, which accepts uh, a string first name. And uh, that is passed down to the uh, field. So really, that's where we are with encapsulation and that's how Java still does it. There are some ways to source generate it now, uh, but fundamentally they haven't implemented properties. So the problem with this is that it's 15 lines for one field. It's just too many lines. So C Sharp from the very first version actually addressed this issue. And what you can do is you could have a property and the property could be defined like this. You can have a string defined as first name and we use Pascal case for that. And then the getter would have to point to the backing field. So that one goes here. And then the setter would be able to set that field based on the value. And the value is being retrieved by whoever is setting the value. So really what this does behind the scenes is it does make a getter and a setter for this property, but it actually just hides that for you in a less verbose way. And now we went from 10 or 15 lines to way less lines now with a field and four lines here. And if I was to go into the program.cs to, to create, then I said user nick equals new uh, user, you could also not do this. So that was actually not possible. So you couldn't just initialize properties like that. What you had to do is you had to define your property object first, and then you can say uh, nick.firstName equals uh, nick here. And once you do that, you could set the value. And if I was to run this, which I cannot because I'm not using a .NET version compatible with that C Sharp version, I would be able to step into the setter and the getter method. Now, how this works behind the scenes is that it will actually create those two methods, that setter method and that getter method. And to prove that this is the case, I can actually go ahead and I can say public void set lowercase set underscore first name, for example, here. Uh, and I can have a parameter string first name. And you can see that this code does not compile because it says member with the same signature is already declared. This is because the way they implement this is that this code is effectively translated to a method with this exact name and also another method, let's say public uh, string get underscore 
first name with that exact case and this is how the retrieval works so really the getter is mapped to that and the setter is mapped to that and the code inside can work you can have logic in here the same way you would have logic in here and then you have that back and field so that's how we used to do it you could not do um, auto properties like this let's say you had first and then like last name you cannot just implicitly implement the getter and the setter even though Almost always uh, during that time, this is the default implementation that you'd have for, for properties. But it was still less verbose than the Java version. So that's what C Sharp um, 1 supported. And actually, to prove you that this is how this was implemented behind the scenes, I'm going to grab that code and go to sharplab.io, which allows me to see uh, the lowered code and examine exactly the methods that are being created from the code you see right now in front of your screen. So I loaded this up and as you can see, the lowered code here is the same with the code we have on the left for that c -sharp 1 version. And the reason why this happens is because there wasn't any need for any lowering of the code at the time because that was the actual native implementation that went into IL code. Now, if I do move to IL, you can see that this is creating the get first name method um, and the set first name void public method, so exactly as I showed you, uh, but there isn't any lowering that happens. So from C sharp high level to C sharp low level. So with C sharp three, what happened is that the team acknowledged that basically all of the basic use cases uh, look like this. You have a back in field, and then you have a getter and a setter, and you don't do any complicated like domain specific logic over here. So they thought, how can we make this even more shorthand? Well, we have a field which we can implicitly define in the background and then a getter and a setter with basically the same implementation almost always unless you customize it. So they went ahead and they added auto-implemented properties. And what this allows us to do is the modern syntax that we know and love, which is you can have the uh, property defined like this and you don't need to specify the getter or the setter method unless you want to override it and customize it in any way. And by the way, at that point, I should say but that you can have specific modifiers for both the getter and the setter. So you can have things like an internal getter or an internal setter or maybe a protected setter. So you can customize specific either the setter or the getter as individual methods and then still have the whole property have uh, a different level of visibility. And this was mainly what changed. Nothing else was added. If you wanted to define a default value for your property, you could not do it like that. It just wasn't implemented yet. That was coming actually three versions later. The way to do that would be that you have to implement uh, a backing field. So you have to say private string uh, first name and you have to set the default value there, which means we go a step back and we point to that backing field. So um, get is return first name and set is the uh, first name equals value. Um, and it turns out many use cases actually needed a default value on the field. So that would get addressed in the future. I do want to go back to sharplab.io, however, to show you how lowering changed here with the addition of that auto property feature. And I go back to sharplab and I replace it here. But as you can see, I still have the getter and the center compiler generated, but I also have this compiler generated backing field. And this points, as you can see here, to this last name. So it is just implicitly created in the background. It's completely transparent to you. You're just dealing with the property as a concern, but you should know there is a backing field behind the scenes. Um, and in terms of IL, not much has changed because it's lowering it into, again, a field and two methods. So that's how we're dealing with this now. I should also note at this point that in version three, um, there was added the ability to initialize properties from uh, the object initialization like we do it now. So you can say first name is Nick, for example, and then uh, last name is Chapsa. So that was also added then. And then C Sharp 6 builds on the convenience uh, approach and it adds what I showed you before that wasn't there, which is auto property initializers or the ability to say um, equals Nick, for example, here. So now you no longer have to resort back to the approach where you have to explicitly define the field, set the field's value and point at it. You can just define the value here and that's going to be the initialized value if nothing sets it from the setter. What was also added was the ability to define a default value for getter only purposes. So if I said um, last name here and there was no setter, 
I could also say this. So this was also added at this point, which then means that what we also got at C sharp six is the ability to do the following. Let's say I have a full name property, which is computed by two other properties. I can now just use a Lambda expression and point to those other properties. So first name plus space plus uh, last name. And this allows us now to create a property that is effectively a method behind the scenes pointing to two other properties. And how do I know it's a method? Let's go back to sharplab.io. And if I paste that file over here, as you can see, there is no backing field for the full name. The full name only has a getter, which points to that string concatenation method, meaning there is no value that's going to be set, meaning this string.concat will be called every single time you call that property, which makes it effectively a method in disguise, which can be tricky if you're doing heavy compute here and thinking that's going to just be calculated once. So be careful. Uh, it looks like a property, smells like a property, but really it's a method. So be careful with that. Now, C Sharp 7 didn't really do much. However, 7.3 added a feature that was really needed for some people. So historically, you could go back to a property and add a property available um, attribute. For example, you can say obsolete over here. Now, this property has a backing field and you might want to add that attribute to that backing field. How do you do that? If you add it here, it applies on the property level. Well, you can now do field and that means that this obsolete attribute only applies on the backing field. It does not apply on the property directly. If I wanted it to also apply on the property, I have to remove the field part. And let's take a look at sharplab.io and see how that works behind the scenes. So I go back here and I paste that obsolete field. So as you can see, if I have the field obsolete for the attribute, the attribute applies on the backing field. The property here does not have it. However, if I remove the field part, then as you can see, it is only added on the property. It is not added on the field. That's why it was added. And of course, uh, if you apply it on both and you say field here, then both the field and the property will have the attribute. So that's what was added in 7.3. It was a minor update, but I think a useful one for those who had a use case for it. Now, .NET 8 didn't really add a property specific feature per se, but the team started expanding on parameter matching and something called property parameters was added. And for example, here I have a user object and it has a first name, a last name and a date of birth. What I can do now is I have this uh, Nick object over here, and if I go uh, here, I can say, and this is both on an if check or a switch expression, I can say Nick is, and let's say I want to check something about the property. Uh, what I can do is I can have a, a property pattern expression here. So for example, angle brackets, and in here I can access property. So for example, date of birth, and because I need a nested item from the date of birth, I can say year, and then year, uh, if I say 1993, then this means that every Nick object that matches that expression um, will step in here. You can expand on this on other things, so you can have ranges and expressions and other stuff. But fundamentally, this is what was added. And in my opinion, because you're mostly working with constants here, um, it isn't really a feature that is really being used in its full potential. It does allow you to have some very niche use cases, uh, but in my opinion, the pattern matching idea um, is a bit hit and miss, but it was added nonetheless in C Sharp 8 and there could be some use cases where this is uh, valid. Now, obviously I'm not doing it justice. I have a dedicated video on pattern matching and the evolution of pattern matching. So if you want to know more about that, top right corner of your screen right now, check it after you finish watching this video. But C Sharp 9 would come in the game and add a very requested feature. And that's the ability to do the following. Let's say you have a property that you want to allow the user to specify upon initialization of the object, but on any other scenario, it should be read only. It should be immutable. It should not be able to change. How can you implement that? Well, previously you can't because as long as you have a setter, this setter is accessible publicly and it can be called. So even though I initialized Nick with a date of birth of this, someone downstream can still go here and say date of birth is uh, and provide uh, a different one. So no one really uh, stops anyone from doing that. However, there is a valid use case to prevent that. 
And the way around it for years and years was that you actually had to have a constructor. And then since you have a constructor, so let me show you how this would look like, um, you would remove the setter completely, and then you would initialize the property like that from the constructor, making it a mandatory property that you have to go through the constructor to create, and you cannot update because there is no setter. Now that's great, but many libraries that use reflection behind the scenes to do their job, for example, at JSON Newton soft or the system.text.json library or automapper or so many other things had to actually code to worry about this being a thing and not be able to automatically match POCO objects to properties, which is usually the pattern you want to follow with and a lot of other stuff as well, because constructors can be long and the code can get very uh, lengthy horizontally. So there's many reasons why you might not want to go with that approach. So what was added is init only properties. So now you can say that date of birth cannot change. You just, you know, you can change your first name, you can change your last name from a domain perspective, but date of birth cannot change. That is an immutable thing. So now the init only allows me to define it when I initialize the property, but I cannot update it downstream in my application's workflow. So very, very useful feature. And then for C Sharp 10, which just launched, you have pretty much the same use case as C Sharp 8. But what happened is extended property patterns, I think it's called, um, were added, meaning you no longer have to have this column based approach here to go to nested properties to have an expression. Uh, what you can do now is simply use the dot syntax, which in my opinion should have been like this from the beginning, but whatever, that's what was added, which affected properties. C Sharp 9 also added records, by the way. So you can have like public record uh, and that record can be oh, same way as above, like a user. And let me just quickly comment this out and you can have this and then this, for example, first name and last name. And this very much works the same. Th these are still properties. Now, the whole idea of the record is that these properties, the way they are defined right here is they cannot be changed. So they're getter only immutable properties. If I take that record and I stick it into shoplab.io over here, uh, you can see that there's tons of code created by the compiler, uh, but fundamentally it works kind of the same. You have a private read only backing field for each property. Those are still technically uh, properties and you still have a getter and an init only setter. It's just, it's still using all the tools we had from previous C Sharp versions and it packages them up in this nice syntactic sugar. It's still a class. It still has a backing field. Those two things still act and are classified as properties and they do go through the constructor and they have all the bells and whistles of properties. So something you should know. And that's it. That wraps up every single version that properties were affected in some way. Now, if you want to see any other feature from beginning to end, let me know and I'll make a video on that. And thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making this videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find a link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe, more than like this, ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.